As the temperature of our surroundings constantly changes, what happens to our internal body temperature? To investigate, Jim is fitted with a special ear probe. It's connected to a digital thermometer and measures his internal or core temperature. It's just over 36 degrees Celsius, 98 Fahrenheit. A similar device measures the temperature of his skin. His skin temperature is lower. At the moment, it's 31 degrees Celsius, 88 Fahrenheit. Put him in a room where the temperature is a sweltering 41 degrees Celsius, 104 Fahrenheit, and we'll see what happens. When viewed through a thermal camera, Cooler skin on the cheeks and nose looks blue or black. Warmer skin areas appear orange. The ear and the skin probes are again connected to thermometer displays, and soon the effects of the high room temperature become visible. Jim's skin is looking mostly orange as its temperature increases. After just four minutes, it's already increased 5 degrees to 36 degrees Celsius. But deep inside, Jim's core temperature remains much more steady. It's risen by only 1 degree Celsius to just over 37. This is a water bath, icy cold. What do you think is going to happen to the skin temperature on Jim's arm and to his core temperature? skin temperature will vary over a wide range, depending on the surroundings. Although Jim's arm is thoroughly chilled, will his core temperature change significantly? In a healthy person, core temperature will stay between 36 and 38 degrees Celsius, between 97 and 100 Fahrenheit, and Jim's stays right there. When you exercise, your muscles generate a considerable amount of heat energy. To prevent your body's core temperature from rising dangerously, that heat has to be gotten rid of. The skin plays a vital role in two ways. When the body is trying to lose heat, the blood capillaries in the skin dilate. They get wider, which allows more blood to flow through them and the skin takes on a redder appearance. Radiation carries some heat away, and sweating also helps to cool down the body. This is how. Sweat is secreted from glands onto the skin's surface where the water will absorb heat energy, evaporate, and leave the body cooler. This time, our subject is sitting in a room that's cold. It's less than 10 Celsius, 50 Fahrenheit. And a large fan blowing cold air will cool him down even more. When Jim is cold, his skin looks pale in color and there's no sign of sweat. His skin temperature begins to fall, and it isn't long before he begins to shiver. When it's cold, blood vessels in your skin become narrow to reduce the heat loss from circulating blood. No sweat is produced, and your hair stands on end, giving you goosebumps. Yet despite the cold, Jim keeps warm inside. His core temperature is still 36 Celsius, 97 Fahrenheit. How do goosebumps and shivering help keep his core temperature steady? Water is essential for life. It's by drinking, as well as by eating, 
that we mainly take in water. But not only does the body take in water, it also loses it. You breathe out water vapor, and water evaporates from your skin. It's most noticeable when you sweat. More obviously, you lose water through urine and feces. Despite these varying water intakes and losses, the body must keep its internal fluids at a constant volume and concentration. The kidneys play a key role by producing more or less urine depending on how much water you take in or lose. As well as sweating heavily for several hours, Lisa's had nothing to drink since yesterday. She should be extremely dehydrated, abnormally low on body fluids. One obvious sign of dehydration is that she's producing very little urine and it's dark in color. On the other hand, Joanne has taken in plenty of liquid over the past few hours. Her urine is plentiful and very pale. Her body is getting rid of water, so it must be fully hydrated. Its water volume must be normal. The kidneys regulate the amount of urine produced. It's their job to keep body fluids, such as blood, at a constant volume and concentration. Blood flows in through the renal artery and out through the renal vein. Inside the kidney, the blood will be filtered by millions of microscopic structures. Blood is carried to a nephron where most of its plasma is filtered out and trickles down a tube. Then exactly the right amount of water and nutrients are reabsorbed to restore the blood to its correct volume and concentration while the discarded waste and water pass out as urine. So what will happen to Lisa and Joanne's urine levels if they both drink a liter of water? They continue to give samples every half hour over a two hour period. Lisa's urine is gradually getting paler, but her body is retaining considerable water in order to regain normal hydration, while Joanne's body, being normally hydrated, has gotten rid of nearly all the water she took in. How did her kidneys do that? Being hydrated, when Joanne drank a large quantity of water, it appeared as an excess volume of fluid in her blood. And when that reached the nephrons and was filtered out, very little water was reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Most of the water passed out as urine, which brought the blood volume back to normal. But if you're dehydrated, what then is happening inside your kidneys? When your body digests food, it breaks down complex carbohydrates into smaller molecules. The simplest carbohydrate is glucose, a type of sugar. Glucose quickly passes into the bloodstream and is carried to all cells which use it for energy. Draw a spot of blood and place it on a special indicator. It's all that's needed to measure the amount of sugar in the blood. These two people haven't eaten since yesterday. For both, the concentration of glucose in their blood is just over 5 millimoles per liter. What will happen after they drink 100 grams of glucose dissolved in one liter of fruit juice, which itself contains fructose, another type of sugar.
just 15 minutes later and their blood sugar has already increased to around 8 millimoles per liter. To find out how physical activity affects glucose levels, one of our subjects gets on an exercise bike while the other sits down and relaxes. For half an hour, our cyclist pedals vigorously, consuming glucose for energy. Then their glucose levels are tested again. Our cyclist's sugar level has fallen from his elevated 8 back to his normal 5. Even though a large amount of glucose has been absorbed into his bloodstream, the excess is now gone. Interestingly, the blood sugar level of our inactive subject has also fallen. His body is reducing its amount of glucose back towards normal. Two of the organs which control blood sugar are the liver and the pancreas. The liver is reddish brown in color and is the largest organ inside the body. The pancreas produces enzymes and hormones. If your blood is rich in glucose, it stimulates the pancreas to release a hormone called insulin. Insulin stimulates the liver to remove the glucose which it stores in the form of glycogen. And so reduces the amount of glucose in the blood back to normal. As we've seen, vigorous exercise dramatically lowers the level of glucose in your blood. Because when your muscles are working hard, they're using glucose as a source of energy. On this graph, we will plot blood sugar levels against time. On the left side, the vertical bar measures millimoles of blood sugar per liter, while along the bottom, the horizontal bar measures time in minutes. The blood sugar level of our magazine reader rose for 15 minutes after he drank all that sugar-laden fruit juice and then gently fell during the next 20 minutes. While the bike rider's sugar level rose similarly but then fell far more dramatically. But what if he kept on pedaling? What would happen if too much glucose were removed from his blood? When the blood contains too little glucose, the pancreas releases a hormone called glucagon. This makes the liver convert some of its stored glycogen back into glucose, which would raise the blood sugar level of our cyclist back to normal. But not everyone produces the hormones which should control their blood sugar level. Donna is diabetic. In her case, that means she doesn't produce any insulin. At the moment, her blood sugar level is 5.9. What will happen when she consumes a glucose drink? As expected, Donna's blood sugar level initially climbs but then stays high for a long time because she doesn't produce enough insulin. If her glucose level rises too high or drops too low, it could be dangerous. But by injecting herself with insulin, Donna can regulate her blood sugar within safe and healthy limits.